Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce our second um, keynote speaker, Tyler Norris uh, from Kaiser Permanente. He's Vice President for Total Health Partnerships at Kaiser Permanente. I had the uh, very enjoyable experience of meeting him in Oakland uh, quite recently on the recommendation of Kat Taylor. She wasn't wrong. And um, here he is. Welcome. Uh, well, it's only fitting I'm often asked to follow His Royal Highness. <laughs> uh, and I've also been asked to trim my talk by about half, so we'll, uh, we'll see as I, move, uh, as I move through. It is truly a delight to be back in uh, my hometown. Um, I just got off the plane from the Skoll Forum uh, a few hours ago in uh, Oxford. Uh, won't surprise you to know that the key topics there were about protecting family farms and smallholders. How do we bring the carbon out of the air and put it back into the soil? And how do we look at the economic injustices, particularly for people who grow food, and look at how our industrialized methods of agriculture are destroying our health and our climate and human lives? And so that's very much the conversation I want to be able to have here. Um, and also to make, again, just as James did so beautifully, this connection between food and climate and the economy and human health and soil and the well-being of people and planet. Wendy, very much following on your themes, uh, too. So I'm not a food person. I work in the health sector. So I, too, am humbled by this. And if you don't understand this now, you will by the time I'm done, if you're in the food sector, you're in the health business at the same time. So I am deeply humbled by the health of this nation. My daughter assists me with that. I've spent the last 25 years working on measurably improving population health. Uh, the other day she came home with a report from the Institute of Medicine that said that after a hundred years of life expectancy in increasing by almost 30 years, children born today will likely live five years shorter than their parents. She said, Dad, you've been on airplanes trying to do this work. What have you been doing? <laughs> what have we been doing? She's right. And on our watch, the degradation of health has continued, particularly in the United States and across much of the world, despite this country spending almost 20 cents of every dollar on sick care services. We live at 30 or 40 in terms of national rankings on everything from infant mortality to heart disease. So this is not working and we are paying for it in our healthcare delivery system. I work in uh, an organization that is a bit unique in the health sector in the United States in that Kaiser Permanente as a $60 billion nonprofit, the 50th biggest organization in the US, is both a health plan, meaning we're an insurance organization that is at risk for the health of our 11 million members, and we're a delivery system with 200,000 employees and 20,000 physicians. In other words, we hold the risk for health and we deliver care. That means unlike most of the sick care system in the US that gets paid for treating illness, we do better when people are healthier. So the buck stops here with externalities. And the increasing cost of chronic disease and cancers and the things I'm about to talk about show up in premiums that have not only uh, made us uh, less affordable over time, but is crowding out the ability of people to even get primary care and preventive services because the demand on the delivery system through illness to a great extent driven by food has not only destroying our health system, but is actually locking people out of access to care in the first place. So I really want to be able to address that as a key piece, yes. Okay, that's Eliza's question for me and for us. What is it on our watch? And I think one of the most important conversations in this room is going to center around this, and I'm going to go right to the punchline because I'm going to have to trim my talk a little bit uh, from this, and I'm going to build on some great work of Patrice Sutton, Dave Olanga, Lucia Sayers, probably in the room here. The food that is produced and how it is produced has a direct impact on human nutrition and the environment. Yes. Which in turn are drivers of human reproduction and development. 
Our conventional food system delivers a massive volume of food, check, but on balance, it is relatively low in price, but high in fats and sugars and oils and calories and low in nutritional value. The intensive application of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, antibiotics, hormones, fossil fuels, as well as chemicals in packaging and transportation are showing evidence of strong negative impact to population health status. And it is damaging not only developmental health, but reproductive health, which is the thing I want to come to most importantly, is how we are squandering the genetic inheritance we're passing on to our children right now, right now. So the annualized cost to try and put this is in the high hundreds of billions of dollars. We have a $3 trillion health sector. 80% of the spend comes from chronic disease. And 80% of that is driven by four primary factors, the big one being also physical activity, right? And food is the second. What we eat has everything to do with this. And, as I'm about to point out, you can't get there through um, medical care. What creates health? 10% medical care access. Now, if you're sick, you need your doctor. But fully 60% of what creates health has to do with our own personal choices in the context of our environments, right? That's what creates health. That means we are in the health business, and those of us at me that are inside the delivery system, yes, yeah, sort of. And it's why this kind of a conversation matters so profoundly. Now, yes, we also spend $150 million a year on food for our members. We deliver 14,000 patient meals a day. We have 54 farmer markets. We're also in food, but we're interested in changing what's driving this in the first place. Okay, underneath this, 80% of the spend, unhealthy diet, inadequate physical activity, tobacco, and otherwise. So, what should we say about food as a core driver of a $3 trillion spend that lands us in the 30s and 40s in global rankings in terms of health outcomes? What do we eat? First of all, place matters. On obesity, here's a, the, a map of the Bay Area. Cool is low obesity, red is high. These are maps of the population. San Francisco, you could say, well, a little more affluent, a little less obesity. Over in Oakland, where I live, um, I don't know if you can even see the map, so apologies, I've got a good color here. Uh, less, uh, less healthy, red, hotter. Diabetes, now you start to see southern part of San Francisco, as well as Richmond and other areas. Uh, hypertension, etc. These are the drivers of health. Now, I'm just gonna tell you this. This is some population data. We are the highest quality provider in every market that we operate in. This is our member data. Same clinical protocols, same world-class physicians. These are the outcomes. Place matters. So, ah, thank you kindly. I was like, appreciate that. The Institute of Medicine has suggested this, and we kind of, we're saying all oh, they eat healthier, move more. The Institute of Medicine said, it is unreasonable to expect that people will change their behavior when so many forces in the social, cultural, and physical environment conspire against such change. So when it is impossible to access healthy, fresh, affordable, locally drawn, sustainable, hopefully organic food, it is almost impossible to change behavior. Many of us in this room, we can go down to the Whole Foods, we work at places where we have great food served by a bon appetit, but not everybody has access to that, so it matters tremendously. In terms of food swamps, the other side of this, if you're not familiar with that, is a geographic area of an overabundance of high energy food, sats, fats, oils, etc. The Rand Corporation said that a ban on the addition of fast food outlets would likely, in South LA, would likely have almost no impact because of the current presence of so much fats and sugars and oils and junk foods and sugar sweetened beverages that it wouldn't matter after all, right? Increasing prevalence of obesity, uh, if you can sort of get a picture of this map, and I'm going to just kind of keep going with this, right now about a third of us are overweight, a third of us are obese, and a third of us are at healthy weight. By 2030, at current rates, two-thirds of, two of us will be clinically obese. 
two-thirds clinically obese. Diabetes, one in three of us born in the United States today will be a diabetic. And if you're African American or Latino, one in two. One in two, right? So let's put this in cost. Obesity price tag right now, 200 to 300 billion dollars a year. Diabetes, about 200 billion dollars a year. In the coming period, it's expected that that may come up to gobble up about uh, a fifth of every healthcare dollar, therefore in the realm of 500 to 700 billion dollars. And if you're concerned about the cost of healthcare and access to care, we have got to actually address this, again, because this is where the buck stops. Equity is probably the most important place for us to focus, and I hope a big part of this conversation, in part because we really have to line up a conversation in this room between how do we help give some people that can afford it an ever groovier health ex food experience, and some people in the room that are talking about really scaling access to healthy, fresh food and hunger, et cetera. And there's really a very different conversation going on. And frankly, despite extraordinarily good efforts by the organizers, the people in the food justice conversation aren't even actually in this room, for the most part. So this got to happen, and let this be a start, and again, fabulous work to get, but we have to be able to address this, because the truth of it is, is that the disproportionate impact of this falls on certain groups, notably people who produce our food and children and low-income families and communities of color and social justice and economic considerations have to be at the front. Sugar-sweetened beverages, the leading driver of obesity in here. I'm really looking forward to what Lori David and others are going to say. There's nothing we could do more than reduce our sugar-sweetened beverage. The way it's metabolized in our bodies goes right to fat. It is poisoning us. Obesity and pregnancy, again, just sort of back to the cost, again, the own challenges. The cost of delivering a baby to an obese mom is $4,300 more expensive than a healthy weight mom. Now, that's not to cause her own challenges and gestational diabetes and what it means. It's just that there is an externalized uh, cost that comes, uh, comes home. Hunger and health. We cannot have a conversation about food without addressing that, in addition to the kind of 800 uh, million uh, that uh, James was talking about, 48 million Americans live in food insecure home, including 15 bil uh, million children. 17 million households in the U.S. are food insecure. And of course, a disproportionate number of those households are with children, African-American, Latino, 10% of all seniors live in food insecure homes. And in case you don't think it matters in terms of human health, a child who goes hungry at least once in their life is two and a half more times to have poor overall health outcomes 10 to 15 years later. Hunger continues to pay in costs on and on again. And it's not only physiological, obviously, the nutrient deficiency, but the psychological impacts of hunger also live on in forms of stress that can be even contributors to adverse child experience, which is impacting the human genome, which I'm headed towards. Um, I don't have time to go into the extraordinary Chamaco study. Uh, thank you, Patrick. And I want to honor the agenda here. Uh, but I think it's very important to understand this study and look it up. It stands for the... Okay. All right. Thank you. Center for Health Assessment of Mothers and Children of Salinas. Many of you know Salinas is uh, 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 the kind of a food... Uh, basket of, in the Central Valley, uh, an extraordinary place of bounty. And here is a little story about the people who grow food uh, in this area. Chamacos also means little children in Mexican Spanish. It's sort of a beautiful uh, description. It's a longitudinal birth uh, study following 601 pregnant women and their children uh, up to age 16. Recently, they added another 300 kids to this. So in this extraordinarily rich agricultural area, here's a little bit about what we know about the impact on workers. Now, first of all, analysis of cancer rates of people working overall. Now, this I'm going to talk about Hispanic people who are growing food versus the overall Hispanic population, corrected for tobacco and income and other different factors. Analysis of cancer among 150,000 California Hispanic farm workers who were members of the United Farm Workers were more likely to develop certain types of leukemia 59% higher. 
because of their exposures to pesticides, et cetera. Stomach cancer, 70% higher. Cervical cancer, 63% higher. Uterine cancer, 68% higher. This is corrected for every possible factor among Hispanics. Farm workers, because of their exposures, are paying an extraordinary price. Um, the organophosphates, metabolite levers, uh, levers 30 to 40 percent higher presence in, uh, in urine levels. 14 percent of women uh, are exceeding the health-based exposure benchmarks uh, for disease. And of course, they are passing these toxics on via their breast milk to their children. Literally, when they bring the child to their breast, they're poisoning her. That's the burden of these women who are growing our food and in those communities. And I encourage you to go in and really uh, uh, Im impact this a little bit. More than 78% of these women in the Chamaco study had detectable levels of at least one organophosphate. Mother's exposure to these during pregnancy is associated directly with a lower IQ and poorer cognitive functions of their children. Their children, and now every child in, in my, is born pre-polluted, right? Every child born in this country is being born pre-polluted with over a hundred different chemicals because of what we are eating and our exposures. That's the gift that we're already passing on. 40% of U.S. children have org organophosphate pesticide levels greater than benchmarks for neurological impacts. This is our contribution to human health. Okay. Um, actually, this is a very interesting way to think about our pesticides and the whole array of inputs that it is essentially uncontrolled medicine because where pharmaceuticals undergo fairly strict scrutiny uh, by the FDA before they're actually used, many environmental chemicals are not even required to be tested and their side effects before their commercial use. So it is essentially, we could view it as uncontrolled uh, medicine. And because of essentially the fact that uh, the overwhelming majority of chemicals, including those identified as, as animal mammary carcinogens, endocrine disruptors, are not even required to be tested, it basically places the burden of us understanding the health, the public understanding the health impact on the public. So we have a significant policy opportunity here, and every group from the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists to the American Society for Reproductive Medicine is saying, we have got to take timely action on policy. We are squandering the future of our civilization in the process of this right now. Throughout, mm, throughout the food chain, there are extraordinary opportunities in production, in processing, in packaging, and transport. I'll share all this so you can kind of do some of the research a little bit later. But I want to ask us to take a thing of how do we put a price? I can quantify the cost of chronic disease and cancers, but how do you put a price tag on human flourishing? How do you put a price tag on economic loss? Maybe in the form of disability adjusted life years, we get into all that kind of stuff quality-adjusted life years, it's in the trillions of dollars, right? Hormones in dairy cattle, widespread, no definitive data, it's understood. Antimicrobials in beef, swine, and poultry. We have people presenting in our, our emergency departments. It is now data that's entered in our electronic medical record for our 11 million members about antibiotic resistance, who increasingly are the superbugs, essentially, we are unable to care for their antibiotic resistance because of the passage of those uh, antibiotics into their bloodstream, essentially ruling out what we can give them as ineffective. It, you, we have to understand that the way in which these bacteria can transfer their genetic material not only to their own offspring, but to completely unrelated types of bacteria, and the speed with which that happens, these superbugs place our own health at tremendous risk in the emergency department. In fact, 10 years ago, that's what changed us to start saying we're not going to buy antibiotic-laced meats began us on our food procurement strategy uh, in, our own, um, in our own organization, which I'll get to in just a minute. So here we are, head in the sand. Now, this is the, this is the scariest part, if I haven't sort of gotten there yet, which has to do with our genetic future and to conversations about the uh, epigenome. epigenome. The potential developmental health and reproductive 
consequences of in utero exposures to toxic environments have immediate impact in terms of birth defects and cognitive impacts, short term in terms of learning disabilities and cancers, and long term effects in terms of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancers later in life. Interesting study, again, limited time, not going to go into it, but during the winter of 1944 to 1945 in the Netherlands, a study uh, during the famine that was taking place during the war, a tremendous study was done on uh, women who were still continuing to give birth, but with a thousand fewer calories in terms of their daily nutrition. Their children born during that period were compared against their sub-siblings that were born in the two or three years before or two or three years after. Much, they're now, these, these kids are now in their 60s. Higher rates of chronic conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity than their siblings. Okay, here's the business. This is one day after fertilization. Sperm meets egg, one day. This is in advance of implantation in the uterus. In other words, within a day, I'm not talking about four or five or six weeks later when mom knows she's pregnant and wants to clean up her act. I'm talking about tomorrow. Her food environment is essentially the environment within which this in utero cell that's just split is living. Here's the extraordinary research by Paolo Ronaldo from this community, from, from San Francisco. Inappropriate environmental cues in utero, which includes the food environment because that before the blastocyte moves into the uterus at about day five, the environment in mom is her food and beverage environment. That's the environment. Is a period marked by tremendous developmental sensitivity. And in this period, Cellular reprogramming is occurring that will predispose disease in adulthood. The bottom line here is that mom, before any idea of her pregnancy, and even half of children are unplanned, right? We don't know. Before she does anything, she is essentially squandering the genetic future of her child. Which means that the default food environment in our schools, in our workplaces, in our communities, have to be changed because how does she know? And she eats what is available to her. And even later when she makes those changes, yes, it's important to change those behaviors, but at one level based on the science of epigenetics, it is too late. So that 30% that's our biological, you know, 10% medical care, 60% behavior, yes, it's time. <laughs> that 30% that is our epigenetics is in play right now. That's how much it matters. So, a good solution solves many problems. And because my time is genuinely up, <laughs> I'm just going to say that we must cross boundaries. And I'm going to be a little shorthand. I don't mean to be crass or judgmental, but between groovy food and food justice, first of all. Right? That's one of them. <laughs> between health and agriculture and climate and nutrition and school food and workplace food. We've done a tremendous amount. We're buying 700 tons now, uh, even f of, of healthy, fresh, organically grown food and serving it in our cafeterias and it completely swapped out what we're serving and have done so many good things and it is not enough. We have to be able to do that at, uh, at scale. We need to internalize the externalities and we need to be able to quantify this and put that price back into food where it needs to be rather than in the sick care system where it is right now. We are not going to get there by just putting little gardens in the schools, although it's part of it. We have to have enough reach, intensity, and duration, in other words, scale, to fundamentally change uh, what's in front of us. I will tell you that the people that soak up 20 cents of every dollar 
our healthcare sector are your partners, and we need you to be able to solve this. So please reach out. Let's continue the conversation. We are, in fact, better together. We can turn this, but it will require an effort that is worthy of our lives, that is worthy of what Eliza challenges me to, and I ask you to join me in it. Thank you.